Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, my dear friends, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, at whatever time you are uh, listening and seeing these uh, lecture series. Uh, this series uh, is on the topic of investment analysis and portfolio management under the Swam Prabha lecture series. And my good name is Raghunandan Sengupta from the IME department at IIT Kanpur in India. So, I thought for the first lecture, obviously uh, each lecture as you know is for one hour and in totality we have 30 hours of lecture covering all the topics. So, even though I had given a small brief um, video about the content of the course, but I thought it will motivate the people who are eager to learn this course to know what are the details lecture wise and topic wise for this whole course. So, as you know this is the topic title or the subject title is investment analysis and portfolio management. So, the total uh, set of lectures uh, are as I just mentioned few seconds back is of 13 number each for 1 hour and even though this is the first lecture, but I will still spend as I said about the content in just briefly, so you can get the overall picture of the course as we move on. The first lecture main title will be microeconomics and financial markets, because we will try to start from an economics point of view, because financial markets, debt markets, commodity markets, everything comes under the overall gamut of uh, the economics principles as such and their macro and microeconomics both are utilized. So, under lecture 1, we will consider what we mean by demand curve and what is a supply curve and what is the overall orientation of the supply and demand curve, why they are like that. We will also consider what we mean by price and quantity and what is optimal price, optimal quantity depending on the demand and supply. Now, obviously, demand and supply would change depending on production capability, uh, supply of goods, demand of goods, so on and so forth. We will also consider what we mean by elasticity, that is more from the microeconomic point of view, um, even though it will would not be that much utilized in finance, but still I like to discuss that, because in a second course, which is more to do with risk analysis, I would like to go into these concepts. We will also consider substitution effect, income effect and how they affect the overall uh, price and quantity depending on the demand and, and supply curve. We will just touch upon utility, what we mean by utility, what is the value uh, a consumer wants, because whenever you are buying and selling in securities, you want to consume or get a value for that. And what are the different type of risk characteristics and under different, three different characteristics a human being or a decision maker can be categorized. I uh, will just touch upon that and we will go into that in details later on. We will also consider what is the brief introduction on the financial markets. In lecture 2, we will go into depth about financial markets, we will cover capital markets, commodity markets, what we mean by that, what is the money market, what are the characteristics, what are the different properties and characteristics and definitions of derivative market futures commodities, what are the other different type of markets which are also operate. We will also touch upon few important terms and concepts, just give their definitions, because this course being more in technical in concept, I will try to just give you a brief preview there and then proceed in the technicalities, technicalities and the detailed analysis of this course. And we will also consider the main characteristics, what we mean by the efficient market. Lecture 3, which will be the introduction on investment analysis, which will start, will give you a brief introduction what we mean by the overall environment of an investment analysis, 
what is the security of financial asset, what we mean and how we calculate the return from this asset or from the investment that return can be of two types total return and, and rate of return. And we will cover both these capital R and small r which is total return is capital R and small r is rate of return and we will visit that more in details in the second part of the course which is to do with financial risks. What are our treasury bills and how treasury bills can be utilized to find out the risk free interest rate. We will also consider long term bonds, what are the financial intermediaries, what we mean actually in depth about risk and return, how the first moment and the second moment actually pertain to the return and risk uh, for an investment and then for a portfolio or a, for a financial asset we will consider that. How we find out the expected value and how variance is or, or also standard deviation is used as a risk measure we will consider in a very simple sense. But obviously as we proceed you will see there are different measures of risk about 13 to 14 different measures of risk we will visit them one by one as we proceed with the this course and obviously for the second course. The fourth lecture again which will continuation of introduction of investment analysis we will consider uh, in details the actual concept of short selling, how it affects your investment, how the optimization problems can be formulated considering short selling is there. And uh, it will also give you an idea that later on as we um, uh, draw the CAPAM model, the security line, the efficient frontier, how it would look considering short selling is there and short selling is not there. There would be different type of investment decisions, some based on, on return, some based on risk, some based on a combination of return and risk and obviously you can consider the third and, and fourth and higher moments accordingly. That means we can cons consider skewness, kurtosis, but that too is more from an academic point of view. We will also consider what we mean by does diversification and why diversification is important. Uh, for a portfolio analysis and how different stocks considering their risk and return are combined depending on the correlation coefficient, how you can reduce the overall risk which basically pertains to diversification would be covered in the fourth lecture. In the fifth lecture which is again a continuation of introduction of investment analysis we will consider the two asset problem and how given this two asset or two portfolios. Uh, how we can get some ideas about the mutual fund, how okay, we can utilize the concept of two assets or so called two portfolios and try to find out the efficient frontier, how it looks like. We will also consider um, um, the risk return diagram and, uh, and then consider extended for the three asset and multiple assets. When I mention about two assets and three assets and multiple assets, it basically gives you an idea that how the optimization mo model can be formulated considering the main assumptions of a convex set actually holds when you are trying to find out the, the overall portfolio, best so called best portfolio. We will consider what we mean by feasible set or a feasible region and uh, depending on the concept of risk aversion concept and non cessation concept, we can find out that how actually the efficient frontier looks like corresponding to the fact that you are aware that how the feasible set of the feasible region looks. We will also consider what is the minimum variance set and uh, we will then depending on these two, two properties of risk aversion and non cessation, we will consider the efficient frontier and what is the best frontier at which point any investor wants to be depending on his or her risk and return criteria, which is basically the concept of what the utility function of that uh, decision maker is. We will also consider from the simplest point of view that as you solve the optimization problem, how you can get a good picture that what is the minimum variance point. And minimum variance point as you can understand is that point where you get the variance for the overall portfolio at the minimum point. Sixth lecture would be again uh, follow up continuation of introduction of investment analysis. It will consider the famous Markowitz model and how Mar Harry Markowitz actually combined the concept of risk and return considering the normal distribution and all the ideas 
of trying to maximize the utility or minimize uh, expected value of the utility or minimize the variance of the utility, how the problems can be analyzed very simply. We will consider two single objective problems separately, one is optimization of the return which you want to maximize and another would be optimization of the risk we want to minimize. We will all we consider these two problems in both these um, uh, conditions where short selling is allowed and short selling is not allowed and both of them would give you different picture how the overall portfolio will look like. Then we will consider the two fund theorem that comes given this um, optimization problem has been solved whether for the case of short selling being there not there we can have two portfolios based on which we can find out the efficient frontier for this n number of risk assets which are there under your consideration. In seventh lecture, we will consider what we mean by riskless lend and borrowing, which means that apart from this n, n number of risk assets, we are also bringing the nth plus 1 risk free interest rate into the picture and how the overall efficient frontier will change depending on an addition of an nth plus 1 a financial asset which is which does not have any risk or does not have any variance theoretically obviously each and every investment has a risk. So, we will just assume uh, that there is no risk and, and, and solve uh, very different varieties of problems accordingly and based on the fact you have the riskless lending and borrowing being there we will consider that how including the one fund that means not two funds are not there now, uh, now anymore we have only one fund plus the riskless lending and borrowing would give you a very good idea how the efficient frontier changes from the case when you initially had n number of risky assets, but now you have n plus 1 number of assets where the first n are risky and nth plus 1 is the riskless um, asset. Then we will go into the concept of more in depth about portfolio theory considering different combinations of, of these two fundamental idea, ideas where short selling is there and riskless lending borrowing is there and in the other cases uh, it, both are not there and different combinations we will consider where short selling is there, riskless lending borrowing being not there and vice versa. And we will try to again revisit how the efficient frontier looks like, how the calculations can be done accordingly. Under port, uh, portfolio theory and under lecture 9, we will consider the uh, incorporation of different type of constraints assumptions which would be uh, included in the model. We will consider a uh, very nice way of trying to bring practicality into the situation where we consider short selling is there and we will consider the Lindner's definition and then we will slowly touch upon the single index model which will give you an idea that how the uh, returns of uh, uh, asset can be utilized to find out, uh, out its value of the returns, the expected value and those expected value um, of the returns um, uh, are basically dependent on a single index which is the market index which will give you an idea that how we consider the overall environment of the market to be the main index which will dictate the price movements and the returns of each and every stock which is operating in that market. Under lecture 10, which is for again for portfolio theory, we will consider non diversifiable risks and which is systematic risk and also the risk which can be diversified and how these two ideas will give you an idea that there is some amount of white noise and there is a risk pertaining to the market and what they actually mean, it will give you an idea. We will also consider in India what are the different two important indices which are there, the BAC and then SE and obviously in the international market you have New York Stock Exchange, the CAC, DAX, FTSE, Nikkei, Hang Seng and so on and so forth. Under lecture number 11 which is portfolio theory we will consider the extension of the single index model go into the multi index model, what are the different type of averaging techniques, how the idea of constant variance covariance model can be utilized in trying to solve um, a whole uh, set of problems for the portfolio theory and considering point of diversification. It will give you a good idea that how we can do that. 
and we will also formulate the portfolio with short selling not allowed and risk test lending, lending borrowing being possible, how the models can be done considering the constant variance covariance models are applicable. In, uh, in the case of uh, lecture 12, which is portfolio theory, we will consider again um, the formulation of portfolio with short selling the normal definition being there, riskless lending borrowing being possible and then consider uh, different, different combinations of portfolio with short selling being allowed, riskless lending being possible, but under this can conditions and for the short selling case, we will consider Lindner's definition to be true. And then later part, we will use the constant variance covariance matrix and then um, solve the problems accordingly in the same line as we had just discussing the first two points as you can see in the slide number 14. Lecture number 13 would be portfolio analysis, we will consider the capital asset pricing model, it is assumptions, what we mean by the capital market line, the pricing line and how the security market line gives you a lot of information on the different assumptions which are true for the, theoretically true for the CAPM model and that would be a quite an interesting set of uh, slides and lectures which will be lecture number 13. Lecture 14 would basically be the last part uh, of portfolio theory and the beginning of utility theory. We will consider different type of indices or, or risk measures or some sort of measures which will give you the idea how the portfolio is doing. We will consider Jensen's index, Sharpe's index, we will consider the risk adjusted interest rate uh, formula, what we mean by linearity of pricing what is certainty equivalent forms, we will consider for these, um, for the last part for the portfolio theory and then start with what we mean by utility theory. Lecture five, 15 will be the continuation of utility theory, we will cover topics considering utility functions, expected value of utility, what are the properties of utility functions and what we mean by non cessation and risk aversion. So, non cessation point I did discuss under the concept of efficient uh, frontier, but we will consider more in details here from the point of view of utility theory. And a human being or decision maker can be risk averse, risk neutral, risk seeking, we will consider different viewpoints and how they can be mathematically analyzed. We will consider what we mean by a fair gamble and based on that we can categorize a human being as risk averse, risk neutral and risk seeking we will also consider the concept of marginal utility. Lecture number 16, again continuation of utility theory, we will consider what we mean by absolute risk aversion property, the relative risk aversion property and why they are important. We will consider four different type of utility functions very simply, quadratic, logarithmic, exponential and power and we will lay uh, some important stress or mention some important points about the quadratic utility function. And this utility function will be appearing again in the second set of, of lecture series, which is basically financial risk. I will come to that later on. Lecture 17, again uh, for under utility theory, we will consider the certainty equivalent, the axioms of utility functions, what we mean, what are the important properties what we mean by geometric mean returns and how geometric mean returns can be analyzed and based on that we can rank the portfolios. There are different type of, of non-deterministic formulations for trying to find out what would be the best decisions. We will consider three or two, four different um, simple models under safety first criteria or the safety first principle. Uh, under utility theory last part, uh, we will consider stochastic dominance, uh, safety first principle and the Chevichier's uh, inequality. And under lecture 18, we will continue uh, considering the fundamentals and technical analysis forecasting and average techniques which are there um, under the in, in a very simple format for the investment analysis as such. Under um, lecture number 19, we will start the uh, different topic cover options, what we mean by call and a long and short call options, put long short, then what we mean by European option, American option, strike price, payoff table and how the payoff graphs are calculated. Under lecture 20, interest and yield, we will consider treasury rates, LIBOR, LIBID, which is the London Interbank offer rate and bid rate. 
and similarly we consider the Mumbai um, interbank um, offer rate and bid rate. We will uh, consider what we mean by zero rate, how they are calculated, how bond prices are calculated, how bond yields are found out, what we mean by par yield, how continuous compounding and compounding interest rate, simple interest rate are related, we will find it out using simple formulations and problem solving, we will also find out how the zero curve is calculated. Continuation with the interest and yield under lecture 21, we will consider what we mean by forward rate, how compounding interests are calculated, how instantaneous forward rates are found out, what we mean by forward rate agreement and what are the term structures or different type of, of are utilized. Uh, for different type of investments, we will consider what we mean by duration and in duration how it is utilized to find out uh, how the bonds are performing or how the investments are performing. Then slowly we will go into lecture number 22, we will consider combinations of different type of options of forwards and cover uh, the gamut through simple problems using the payoff matrix and the graphs. We will consider combinations of forward options, call and a put what we mean by covered call, protective put, bold spread, using calls would be considered. We will continue in lecture number 23, which will consider bold spread using puts, bear spreads using both call and puts with different uh, ideas that the prices may have a trend to increase or decrease, the strike price of different type of, of options uh, with the put or call can be. Uh, different, put can be different, call can be different and how they can be managed to find out under what situation we will use a put and call depending on the price fluctuations or change. Lecture number 24, uh, which is continuation combinations options forwards, we will consider butterfly spread using calls and then in puts, what we mean by strangle spread and what are the properties of that, considering the strike price the payoff, how the matrix can be found out, how the graph can be drawn and we will use simple examples and they can be used and as you go through the lectures, you will understand the very simple problems can be solved even with a lot of informations, um, uh, we are using a very simple excel sheet and even if the problem is complicated, they are if you understand the fundamentals, it can be tackled uh, very easily. Under lecture 25, we will consider swaps, both interest and currency and under interest and currency, we will consider how to change asset to a liability and liability to asset depending on which position you are in. Lecture number 26, we will we'll consider different type of risk reduction uh, um, methodologies using options and forwards. We will again come to the con con definition of risk, not standard deviation now anymore how forwards and options with downward trend, upward trend, call and put, short call and put can be combined to find out the overall combination reduces your overall risk. 27th lecture we will consider the binomial tree risk neutral valuations under which we will have the concept of binomial tree. Obviously, it can be extended to multinomial trees also. What we mean by risk test portfolio, what we actually definition of risk neutral valuation how stochastic process properties or marker property can be utilized and we will consider discrete continuous time and variable concept and how one idea can be utilized to have a good understanding how the stock prices fluctuate. We will consider volatility in a different viewpoint, how standard division and variance can be utilized to understand volatility. Lecture number 28, we will consider more in depth about stochastic process or linear process, Ito's lemma. Ito's lemma is quite famous and has a lot of bearing on, on the derivation of the Black Scholes model. We will consider the general linear process, linear process and what we mean by the Ito's process, what are the assumptions for that. Lecture number 29, which is continuation of linear process in Ito's lemma, we will consider the ideas of Monte Carlo simulation using simple problems, what is Ito's lemma and how Taylor series expansion in a multidimensional case can be utilized to find out the Black Scholes model. And finally, in lecture number 30, we will consider different type of exposures considering delta, gamma, vega, theta, rho and what actually they mean for a portfolio and such. So, with this um, I will 
try to come even though I know that uh, it, it took about uh, half an hour or, or 25 minutes to give you a, a brief background over the overall course, but I am sure this will give you a generally a good idea that what we are going to follow for all the um, 30 hours of lecture which would be there. So, with this um, I will yes, close this slide and then uh, start with the analysis of, of this course as such. So, without much ado and, and, and wastage of time, let me come to lecture number 1 uh, under this investment analysis and portfolio management. So, it is basically the idea which we will be considering and obviously, the basic very basic ideas and, and concepts of microeconomics and, and how have they have an implication of the financial markets. Obviously, macroeconomics is also utilized and if we consider all those things the course definitely would be a little bit more heavy in the sense both number of hours would extend more than 30. So, I have kept it as minimal as possible and any extra information which is need needed to analyze uh, investment analysis. I would suggest that uh, let us keep it as simple as possible. If anybody is trying to go into more into depth of economics, I would suggest that he or she can definitely pick up the nuances and the details of economic theory both macro and micro, but for this course let us keep it as simple as possible. Now, what are I have already mentioned when we started uh, this uh, lecture that means, as I was going through the definitions. So, we will consider the demand curve what we mean by supply curve and how depending on the demand and supply we can find out the price and the quantity and what we mean by elasticity. Elasticity means basically is a, as a rate of change of a function. We will consider that what is the substitution effect, substitution effects um, is there and there would be an income effect and what they actually mean. We will consider again I am saying utility from very simple point of view, we will not go into the details like uh, absolute risk aversion, relative risk aversion, non association risk aversion properties, uh, all the different type of utility functions we are not going to deal as of now in at least in the first lecture. We will uh, touch upon the idea of risk and then start of a simple analysis of what we mean by the financial markets under which we one one needs to operate to understand how investment analysis and portfolio decisions can be made. So, under microeconomics there are different concepts um, depending on the demand and supply, but two very important concepts which come out under micro concept is basically price and quantity. So, we will denote price by P uh, and we will denote the quantity by Q. Now, this price and quantity both are determined by the equilibrium point where the demand and supply curve meets. So, depending if the demand is very high or demand is very low, if the supply is, is high or a low, obviously they will come to an equilibrium point because consider if the demand is uh, is is very high and the supply side is very low now obviously, there would be huge increase in the cost or on the price, price would be very high. And if it is if the demand is low uh, is, is low and the supply is huge then obviously, the price would be much low, but depending on on the, the persons uh, the indifference curves uh, people who have studied economics are aware of the indifference curves. Um, depend on how the indifference curves may shift. So, the, dem the demand and supply would have different point of intersection which will give you an idea that, that the quantity and the price would change. So, as I said in this in the second point under slide number 5 price and quantity both are determined by the equilibrium point which basically is the demand and the supply curves where they meet. Now, let me explain it here. So, we we generally have the demand curve which is shown here and this is a bold blue line and we have the supply. 
So, if you only consider the supply and the demand depending on the price and the quantity, if you look at it as the quantity increases or and obviously, if the supply is, is increasing, then obviously, in that case the price would also commensurately increase. But on the other hand, if you consider the demand as the quantity is increasing, the price will decrease. And obviously, depending on, on where they meet, which is the point which I am now showing with the laser, this is the point which is the equilibrium point which is P naught Q naught. So, P naught is the price and Q naught is the, the quantity. So, based on the demand and supply, which is the blue line, bold line for the demand and red bold line for the supply, we have the optimum point as given. In case, so let me try to find out if, so as we can see uh, the demand is the line which is blue in color, this one bold, bold one. I am just uh, marking it in a zigzag manner and the demand and the supply is marked by the, the red one. So, this point which we see, I will use a different color say for example, the violet one, this point is basically the point Q naught P naught. So, that is the optimum quantity and price uh, depending on the demand and supply being D and S. Now, suppose the demand changes. So, consider the demand moves on to the right. So, this shifts and as it shifts, so obviously it will mean that considering the supply is same. So, obviously, the next point which I will mark with the green one becomes this. So, now you have a new point which is the green one which will give you Q 1 and P 1 depending on the case the supply is same and the demand has, has changed which means that as demand is changing it is increasing remember because of the shift to the right. Hence, they would be a, the change in the quantity and the price depending on uh, the slope of the, the supply line or supply curve and the demand curve obviously, the quantities Q 1 and P 1 can be found out accordingly. So, the difference between Q naught and Q 1 or the difference between P naught and P 1 may be more or may be less depending on as I said about the orientation or the uh, how slant uh, the D and S lines are. Now, in case as demand changes, so it has changed as I mark to D 1. Correspondingly, say for example, the supply changes to say, say for example, S 1. So, in that case, as there is a commensurate change in both of them, so now your demand and supply would basically give you a new point P 2 price and Q 2 as the quantity. So, depending on the movements of the supply and, and, the, and the demand curve, depending on how the, the production function changes or the overall economic changes, you can have different combinations of price and, and, and uh, quantity. Now, this will give you an idea that depending and obviously, it would not have um, uh, a direct implication that we need to find out the price and the um, uh, quantity accordingly depending on the demand and supply, but we we'll use some ideas that how the prices and so on and so forth for the returns for the stocks of the financial assets can be calculated accordingly. Now, this shift in the demand or the shift in the demand and supply can result in different price and quantity equilibrium points. So, as they change you will have different equilibrium points which will give you different values of P and Q. Now, demand depends as I was saying depends on both the price income and the prices of other goods. So, other goods prices are increasing decreasing it will have an effect on the overall price of the, of the product 
for which we are trying to find out the demand curve and the supply curve and it will have it will shift accordingly either shift on to the right or on to left that means go above or below the demand point the actual demand curve. So, that will give you an idea that how the, the equilibrium point will change. Similarly, supply would depend on both the price and on the other variables which basically dictates the, the overall supply potential of that goods. By goods I mean tangible goods, any services, any financial assets whatever it is and depending on that you will have different price and, and the values of quantity. Now, coming back to the elasticity what we mean elasticity means how so called um, sticky or the what is the rate of change. So, elasticity basically means measures the sensitivity of one variable to the other. So, at the rate of change of one with respect to the other which is basically in a very simple sense d y d x. So, d y d x is in the univariate case and d y d x can be for the multivariate cases also. So, basically in, in concept of, of uh, microeconomics it actually means the percentage change that will occur in one variable in response to 1 percent increase in another variable. So, obviously this increase can have a negative effect of that of the percentage change in the other uh, dependent variable also. So, d y d x can be positive or negative. So, that will give you the rate of change which is basically the elasticity. Now, there are basically two types of elasticity one is price elasticity of demand which is D. D means the demand uh, which we which we have been trying to uh, specify and another is the price elasticity of supply which is S. So, price elasticity of demand basically measures the percentage change in the quantity demanded Q remember resulting from 1 percent increase in the price P. So, as P changes by 1 percent what is the effect it has on the quantity demanded. So, what is the rate of change of quantity to with respect to 1 percent increase in the price. So, that will give you the rate of change of, of the value which would we would denote by price elasticity of demand depending on the on, on the, the movement of the price what effects it has on the demand. When we consider the concept of, of price elasticity of supply then we are not considering anything about the demand uh, obviously. So, it will measure the percentage change in the quantity supplied. So, in the first case also it was the quantity in the second case is also is the quantity quantity resulting from 1 percentage increase in the price. So, d y d x 1 based on, on the increase in the price the second one also based on the increase in the price 1 percent change, but what it has an effect on the demand and the supply will give you the rate of change of these two functions how the curves shift. So, if you remember the curves which you have drawn here the rate of change would basically shift the curves accordingly. And we are move considering for this, uh, this example the curves are moving parallel to each other. So, let me draw use a different color. So, they can either move up or down and you have the y axis and x axis as already mentioned for pertaining to q and p and you can find the d y d x of these functions accordingly. Now, obviously, they would be substitution effects because as one price increases people would be less prone to buy that product because the prices are high and they will try to replace that actual product with a similar substitutable product. Like somebody drinks hot beverage. So, if the price of tea is increasing he or she will try to replace with coffee or vice versa. Somebody takes rice then if the price of rice uh, increases it will be replaced by wheat. I am considering perfectly substitutable products obviously, all products are not perfectly substitutable uh, with each other and uh, what the examples which I gave tea and coffee rice wheat uh, are few of the good examples which can be stated here. 
So, substitution effect means a fall in the price of, of good basically would have two effects. The first one is the consumers will tend to buy more of that good that has become cheaper as I said and less of those goods that are now relatively more expensive, which is obvious because your budget is, is fixed and your total consumption if it is fixed depending on budget constraints. If one good is increasing in its cost, you will try to buy the other product, because you have to basically meet your demand, demand or whatever requirements are. So, this response to a change in the relative price of the goods as one decreases or all in increases is basically called the concept of substitution effect. So, one product is being substituted by the other, considering as I said they are perfectly replaceable with each other, perfectly substitutable. Now, we will come for the concept of the income effect. The fall in the price of the goods would have a the second effect, which is because one of the goods is now cheaper, consumers in enjoy an increase in the real purchasing power, because your budgets are fixed. If the goods are now cheaper, so you can buy more quantity of that. So, let me continue reading it, because one of the goods is now cheaper, consumers enjoy an increase in real purchasing power, as they are better off, because they can buy the same amount of good for less money. So, if your budget is fixed and you want to buy uh, the quantity of goods and if the price is less, obviously you will buy more in quantity, but if your quantity consumption is fixed, then obviously your budget allocated to buy those number of quantities would definitely decrease as it states here in the second point. Because it is because they can buy the consumers can buy the same amount of goods for less money and they have money left over for additional purchases if required. The change in the demand resulting from this change from this change in real purchasing power is called the income effect. So, depending on your fixed value of consumption your amount of income which is to be allocated to buy the fixed number of, of quantities of that goods would definitely be much less. So, you will have extra surplus amount of money which you can utilize and we will see this concept of how in, in portfolio management that if your overall budget because obviously, whenever you are trying to find out the concept of portfolio management or investment analysis your budget is fixed. And as the, the demand and supply of the product changes, price changes, price changes means return changes, return, which is rate of return and the total return, they change, which means that you can buy more or less of uh, the similar stocks or the quantum of stocks which you can buy. Say, for example, for Tata Steel, Tata Motors, Reliance, whatever, will increase and decrease. And that will have an effect that uh, considering the, the overall budget overall income, overall amount of money which you have, you will basically readjust your portfolio. Keeping in mind as I always said that your main idea is to diversify, maximize your return, minimize your risk. So, obviously, you can do both of them that means, maximize your return and minimize your risk that both can be done, but then obviously, you will go into the realm of multi criteria decision making or multi objective decision making, but we would not be discussing multi objective decision making at least in this course, we will consider single objectives return or risk. So, depending on, on the, the budgets as I said amount of money uh, change in the decrease or increase in the price of the returns of a particular financial asset, you will try to readjust your portfolio accordingly. Now, I did mention as we are discussing the concept that um, Markowitz concept that how he utilized very subtly, very interestingly and in a, in a fantastic way tried to utilize the concept of trying to maximize your utility, minimize your uh, maximize the expected value of the utility, minimize the variance of your utility based on the fact that your main idea was to increase the overall value of investment, but at the same time try to decrease your overall dispersion. Variance is basically a measure, measure of dispersion. Now, in the field of economics uh, in generally, uh, utility would basically be a function and which is basically measures the amount of benefit which you get. 
like the benefit of investment, benefit of say for example, trying to buy a car, benefit of trying to invest in an asset, benefit of trying to basically buy a house, benefit of getting a good education, whatever it is. It means it gives you a benefit, but obviously benefit in many of the cases can be negative also in the sense say for example, even though it is not a part and parts of the discussion uh, for this, this other sets of lectures from 2 to 30 for under the realm of investment analysis, but say for example, you are producing something in a factory and they can be pollutions, pollutants. So, that would basically have a negative effect, so that comes out as a negative utility, but you have to balance it accordingly and with the concept ideas even though it is again I am saying it is not a part and parcel of the course, but this ideas of sustainable development in any spheres is now coming in, in a big way. In, in the areas of different type of decision making. So, uh, that would be a totally different topic not covered under uh, investment analysis. So, uh, let me continue reading it, it utility basically um, is a measure of how much benefit consumers derive from certain goods or services, goods or investments we will consider here. From a finance point of view, it refers to how much benefit investors obtain from portfolio performance. Portfolio performance is increasing, decreasing, whether the benefit is increasing, decreasing. So, obviously, you will have an idea depending on the utility function of that decision maker. What is his or her risk preference? Is it uh, does he, he or she want more risk? or does he or she want uh, uh, less risk or he or she is indefinite? Based on that, you can analyze how utility theory can be utilized to understand the concept of portfolio analysis also. Generally, as I said, when I was discussing about Markowitz model, so uh, there it was basically trying to maximize your expected value of the utility. So, here generally marginal utility is generally decreases with increase in consumption. So, more I give you more obviously you will want based on the point of an of the fact of non cessation, we will come visit non cessation property later on. But there in general even though we do consider that uh, the rate of change of the function of the utility keeps on increasing at an increasing rate, uh, but there are uh, there are other two other viewpoints which are also true that means it will increase at a constant rate and another thing is they increase at a decreasing rate. So, generally human beings uh, consumption pattern will increase, but the increase will slowly plateau slowly fall down that means rate of change of the function will increase, but it will increase at a decreasing rate. So, generally the marginal rate utility which is the rate of change decreases with the increase in the consumption of the wealth. So, Obviously, in the sense that if somebody likes sweets and a person is very hungry, so you give him her a sweet in the morning and he or she is very hungry, he or she consumes it. You give the second, third, fourth sweet and you keep giving him or her. So, obviously, the person is happy, but at some point of time more consumption of the sweets is, is not possible for him or her, because his or her appetite is already full the person has been satisfied, hunger has taken, taken the, the leaven of pangs of hunger has been taken care of. So, obviously, in that person the person's um, willingness to have the nth plus 1 sweet, nth plus 2 sweet, so on and so forth would basically uh, decrease. That means, there would be more and more reluctance to go for higher levels of, of consumption in the same way more and more wealth which is there, people are able to invest and, and ma maximize the utility, minimize their risk and make a balance, but after a certain time there is the person would not be any more interested to do that investment anymore. Hence, the idea is to maximize the utility subject to many constraints, constraints which I uh, when I am talking about the point of maximizing utility obviously, I always mean by the fact that you are trying to maximize the expected value of the utility. Subjects, what are the constraints? There can be many constraints and when we come to the realm of the, uh, of the area of portfolio investment, 
constraints can be pertaining to the amount of wealth which you can invest, amount of the money which you can invest in, in any of the stocks considering or the scripts considering you have a portfolio which consists of n number of risk assets. It can be pertaining to your level of risk, you do not want to uh, increase the overall level of risk, maybe more than 10 percent or 20 percent because you are not very comfortable or maybe you want to have a return which is greater than 30 percent, any stipulated value, whatever investment you do, you always want to ensure the average or the return of the portfolio is greater than or equal to 30 percent. They can be different type of other type of investment based on tax, based on dividend and so on and so forth or based on combinations you want to do, like say for example, it may be stipulated the overall investment which you can do for each any of this n number of risky asset stocks have to be between 10 percent to 30 percent. That means, any of the investment in any of the stocks cannot be below than 0.1 of your total amount of wealth and cannot be more than 30 percent of your total amount of wealth. So, they can be different type of, of, of actual practical constraints which can be formulated in the problem. By the word risk and the word risk will be coming up time and again in this course, in the financial risk analysis course and other areas also. Nowadays we see, we see risk analysis being coming on in, in supply chain management, risk analysis there in decision sciences, in statistics in many things. Risk is basically the level of uncertainty. So, by the word risk we may mean volatility, we may mean standard deviation, we may mean um, um, variance, we may mean later on we will see the concept of value at risk, conditional value at risk, expected regret, expected shortfall. There are different ways of trying to analyze the concept of risk. And we will also see the, the concept of risk uh, does have a lot of mathematical properties, those diff four different properties which are there under risk analysis, um, which should be uh, actual measure of risk. We will visit this, I am just mentioning, but we will visit that in the second course. Even though I am, I am time and again referring to the second course, is not that I am delegating all the concepts later on in the second course, but considering the overall gamut and the sphere and the overall coverage for the first course, I would be mentioning that in order that uh, it should definitely make the listeners and the viewers much more uh, inclined to continue listening to these lectures, the first set of lectures for this investment analysis and then later on for the risk uh, analysis for the financial system. So, let me continue reading it, risk is an uncertainty associated with any financing uh, including financial transactions. And as I said risk aversion, a person can be risk averse, he or she wants to avoid risk. Um, that means, in that case the person's uh, rate of uh, or, or acceptance of trying to invest more and more in risk assets slowly falls. So, he or she is less willing to invest in more risk assets, because the balance between risk and return is, uh, is slowly changing in the sense the person does not want to get that extra amount of return, because he or she thinks the extra amount of risk he or she is going to, to face would be of a much higher consequence with based, based on the return what he or she is getting. Risk neutral would be the person uh, whether an increase and decrease is there the person is willing to take the decision of an increase and decrease accordingly. And the risk loving person would be the base case where the person thinks that extra amount of risk if he or she is willing to take that the compensating fact based on the return would be much more beneficial for him or her. That is what the investor is saying. So, each person has different viewpoints. So, obviously this graph which I am going to draw would be coming up later, but let me just make it a little bit clear. So, if you have the, the wealth or x function which you saw, x is the variable. So, later on we will try to utilize wealth in order to un understand the concept of utility. So, if you have these, uh, the risk neutral curve would be this, which means a straight line d y d x. So, this is the line for the risk neutral curve. If you had uh, the, the 
risk averse that means as the rate of change of the function it increases, but increases at a decreasing rate. So, this would be the case risk averse person and if the person is uh, sorry for that if the person loves risk. So, now obviously, the, per, the graph would be going like this. So, if you see this which is very simple to understand, so, but still I would like to highlight that here the rate of change of the function or d y d x which is tan of theta is constant. So, this theta remains same, but if you consider the graph the, the green one. So, in the first case see for example, it was theta 1 as it increases you see that theta 1 now falls to theta 2 that means, this graph is slowly becoming parallel to the x axis. And if you have the risk loving person initially this was say for example, theta 3 as you go up you see it goes to theta 4 where theta 4 is greater. Now, here what we have mentioned and measured along the x and the y axis. So, let me make it clear. So, basically this is x or later on we will see this is the wealth and if we see the y axis it is basically u x or u w depending on how the analysis is being done. So, you can have analysis of this type of risk aversion, risk neutral and risk loving properties. So, my financial markets are people where they trade financial securities, it can be a stock, it can be a bond, different type of financial instruments. They can be derivatives, which can be options, forward, futures, they can be derivatives based on commodities, options as I discussed if you remember when we I was giving the definition of the overall gamut, overall view of this course, they can be call put, they can be um, forwards, uh, long forward, short forward and all these different type of, of um, instruments can be there. So, there what are the types of financial markets? So, there are different ways we will discuss that. So, they can be capital market which are basically I am just kind of going to just deal or mention about stock and bond market stock markets which we will be discussing in the main focus of the studies. They can be commodities, commodities market can be based on grain, wheat, material, livestock, log whatever these commodities are being sold and bought. They can be money market depending on the demand of money which is the most fluid one. Um, um, they can be a seller or buyer, they can be loans taken, um, they keep, you can basically lend it you can go for a deposits whatever it is they can be derivative market derivative markets this the options futures forwards uh, then uh, you can have a different varieties of options can be american options uh, european options uh, different combinations of them you can have the futures markets depending on the how the prices are going to fluctuate you can basically go for for different type of combinations of of derivatives in order to lock your uh, profit or minimize your risk. They can be different type of uh, financial service markets, um, loan is given, different type of loans can be there, education loan, car loan, business loan, house loan, uh, medical loans. Depository markets can be there depending on, on uh, long term, short term deposits, they can be deposits as we know nowadays can be for uh, from the point post office point of view fixed deposits can be there in the banks, they can be in national saving certificates, uh, Kisan Vikas Patra. So, these, these are different type of deposits people do go for a long term one. They can be in the mutual funds, they can be different type of SIPs, different type of investments happening. They can be non depository markets also. They can be foreign exchange markets depending on the demand and supply of say for example, Indian rupees to dollars, Indian rupees to euros, Indian rupees to dirhams and so on and so forth. Depending on demand and supply uh, obviously, your selling and buying rate would be different. Nowadays, we definitely hear about the cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin and so on and so forth. 
they can be immediate trading of, of securities, immediate exchange, so the, which is the spot price. As of now, what is the demand and supply? Based on that, uh, the price is calculated. They can be interbank linking rate, repo rate, uh, overnight rate, and this is the amount of transaction which is happening between different banks. Uh, who are the players? They can be individuals, companies, corporate, banks, financial entities, investment banking, uh, financial, in they can be financial intermediaries also, who intermediate between different type of players. They can be insurance companies, pension funds, mutual funds, banks, uh, stock booking houses, uh, and so on as commodity houses. Markets for financial markets can be stock exchange, derivative exchange, they can be money market which I have already discussed, bond market, like government is floating bonds, they can be very good foreign exchange markets, commodities. And as they are lenders, the borrowers obviously if I am going to um, uh, lend something, they would be um, a borrower who is willing to take that. So, it can be um, uh, individuals be their companies can be their corporate governments can be there, municipality, public corporations, private corporations. So, both the, the, the set of lenders are buyers, that means depending on demand and supply based on which the price is calculated, they would be different entities in the overall market, in the financial market. What are the functions of financial markets? They are a, a way of trying to basically transfer the resources, amount of money, amount of asset it has to be exchanged in order to the economy to, to grow. It enhances economy, builds up the economy, more fluidity is there in the market, productivity increases, There's, the huge amount of capital formation is, is generated and, and people do make profits, uh, the business goes on, the economy goes on, the country or the society prospers. And it also helps financial markets depending on demand and supply, the price is determined as you saw price and quantity. It helps as a good fluid transparent sales mechanism process and information uh, if it is absolute uh, all for all the players, information is complete between all the players. Who are the providers, uh, what is the functions of the financial market? It funds uh, the borrower. So, the borrower wants to get the money, he can uh, go to the bank and, and, and uh, get a loan. It helps the lender uh, with the market where the borrower is there and it, it provides him a market for lending. It gives the liquidity in bank because people are coming and depositing money, people are coming and, and, and taking money. So, this is the fluidity. More the demand and supply, obviously, the difference between the lending and the borrowing rate would decrease. It becomes credit worthiness if people are, are willing to take a loan and return that loan, the credit worthiness of the person increases. It helps in bringing credit worthiness in the market. It helps the people to save a fixed deposit, recurring deposit, different types of, of uh, post office investments, it can be done. It helps a good investment market, people are willing to invest money in order to venture into different type of economic frontiers, different business, different uh, production capabilities can be built up, where the amount of money required is huge. Obviously, people would rather than trying to utilize his or her own money, it is better that if money is, is borrowed small, small amount from different investors, it the uh, overall risk can be uh, divided among, amongst innumerable players in order to venture into that field where there may be uncertainty initially. So, as I was discussing about the economic growth, so functions of the financial market, it helps economic growth of the economy, of different sectors of the economy. It helps and initiates a place for trading where people, lenders, borrowers can come, they can exchange uh, the, what is the demand and supply, there is more transparency, more fluidity, less of uncertainty in the system and people can buy and sell in the financial market. And as I said, it basically functions as a set of equal set of information which is there for the small players, big players, for all the type of lenders and borrowers. With this, I will, um, I know I have a little bit short uh, over one hour, it may be about one hour, five minutes, six minutes. 
but this being the first lecture I am sure we will slowly get into the mood of trying to uh, continue the lectures and keeping it well within the time frame one one hours. So, with this I will end the first lecture and continue in the second lecture about more into financial markets and how they behave, what are the important properties which are there and what are the different type of definitions with some ideas of actual data, how the graphs look like, I will discuss that later on. Uh, have a nice day and thank you very much. Thank you.